Craig Clements, uh, Professor of Meteorology and Director of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. And you've got the fire weather lab that was up at the Dixie Fire. Uh, first, explain to me what the fire weather lab is. So we've actually grown into a new wildfire center and the fire weather research lab is part of that center. And we have a number of faculty that were recently hired in 2020 uh, focusing on fire science. So we have combustion physics, fire dynamics, fire modeling, social science and wildfire management and fire ecology. And so these faculty come together and we are trying to tackle the wildfire problem of the Western US and particularly California from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. This mobile weather lab that you brought over to the Dixie Fire, explain to me, describe what this is, how it works and what you hope to accomplish from that. Yeah, well, the mobile assets consist of two trucks. One truck is equipped with a, a Doppler LiDAR, which is like a laser-based radar that gives us vertical wind profiles through the atmosphere. And we can launch weather balloons from that truck as well. We have a surface weather station. The other truck is equipped with a special KA band Doppler weather radar. And that type of radar is specifically tuned for small particles such as cloud droplets, but it works really good for ash. And so it's a great tool for studying wildfires. And with those two components, what are you able to find on a fire like what you were out at the Dixie Fire? So when we deployed to the Dixie Fire, we were off of Highway 395 and we were monitoring the plume and the winds as the fire made its way over the Sierra Crest and down towards th the highway. And so what we can do is we can point the radar towards the fire and scan the plume, both uh, in the vertical and the horizontal. And so we can measure the winds inside the plume right at the fire. In addition, with the wind profiling LIDAR, we can measure the vertical column in the atmosphere of the wind profile. And so that allows us to understand how the winds are responding to that fire. And these are measurements that are really difficult to obtain. And so with the new state of the science fire models, particularly the ones that we're running at San Jose State, we need those data to better tune those models and understand how those models are actually working. So uh, right now, is this uh, application that's being delivered to firefighters or is this just internal for research? It's, it's both. So uh, in July, we were requested up to the Dixie Fire to provide some meteorological observations. So we can always do that. And what we do is we either tweet or uh, text out the data that we observe, because sometimes we're in areas where we don't have any uh, uh, communication capability. Uh, another aspect is that we want to collect the data so we can just fundamentally understand how large fires and extreme fire behavior works because these are observations that we just don't have right now. Most fires are poorly sampled and poorly understood. And so that allows us to actually measure what's happening at the fire front. Not to mention that some of the monitoring sites get blown over by the fire. So when you're looking at within that plume or that column, how are you gonna get it if it's so active and winds are 10 times as strong as the surrounding environment? So right. value. It's very hard to uh, quantify how the fire is uh, changing the local weather conditions. And that's really our goal is to better understand what we call fire atmosphere interactions, how fires create their own weather, how they create clouds, fire cumulonimbus, and what those wind circulations do to the fire behavior. When you were on the Dixie Fire, did you find anything in particular that uh, you found uh, out of the ordinary or concerning, dangerous? Well, yeah, the area that the uh, when the fire crossed 395, it was associated with a, a vortex. So there was two vortices that formed as this fire came down the mountainside. And it's something that we kind of expected because generally on the lee side of mountains, you get fire whirls and, and big circulations where they, they rotate. So that's what we were kind of expecting. So we set up the radar to scan across the whole fire and we were able to measure those circulations. And so that was pretty exciting. But the fact that it moved across the road so quickly was quite surprising. The other part of this is how rapidly our fire environment is changing, particularly for Northern California. I say rapidly, although climate models have been showing that this is exactly what they expected mm -hmm. to be happening as we enter this drier and warmer world. How can something like this research help in our firefighting efforts to protect not only people that are fighting the fires, but also those that are in that wild land urban interface. 
Well, just the fact that we're getting observations of the fire environment that we've never been able to collect before is, is unique, and that will help improve our fire forecasting models, which will help protect uh, communities and provide more safety for firefighters in the fire front line. So when we go to a fire, we actually can detect a lot of the wind shifts before they happen on the fire line. So that's something that we're really uh, hoping to uh, do more often. Is that the primary focus area or is there are there other parts of this that um, you see really taking off as we move forward with our wildfire behavior? Yeah, I mean, the wildfire behavior that we're seeing in Northern California and across the West is getting worse. I mean, we're seeing very fast uh, rates of spread of these fires, long distance spotting, a lot of heat release. Part of that is weather driven. A lot of that is just the dryness of the fuels and the amount of fuels or what we call fuel loading. The parts of the Sierra Nevada, they just have so much accumulated uh, fuel that they're, they're burning really hot. And so that's causing a much more heat release, which then causes a big change in the atmosphere. And so we're trying to quantify that with these new tools. And that allows us to better model these conditions. And we can predict it in the future because if we know if we can model what's happening now more accurately than we can model what may happen in 50 years as the climate gets really warm. And Craig, since you're not only working on the fire lines, but also working towards research, how does our fire future look to you? Well, I, you know, when we, if it, it looks grim and this is something that the fire climate and wildfire research community has been saying for a long time now that as we get into more uh, warmer and drier conditions, we can expect bigger and hotter fires. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And with the current drought, our fuel moistures, the live fuel moisture content, the amount of water in the plants is some places in California, it's lowest that's ever been. And so that really drives this fire behavior where the fires just are spreading so rapidly.